All right. So we talked about some of the challenges of running a service mesh in an enterprise environment, certainly across multiple clusters. Um, you know, you got multiple teams and, you know, tenancy and gateways and all this stuff that has to come into, you have to, you have to solve these problems. And, uh, and Solo is really good at that. Now, one of the things that we've done is we've worked with some of the largest deployments of Istio and Service Mesh probably in the world. I know eBay's got a huge deployment and so on, but we, we, we've seen massive, like thousands or tens of thousands of clusters of, uh, of, of Istio. And one of the things working with the massive deployments as well as working with you know, everyone in between you know, we, we've, we've, we've come across opportunities to improve the service mesh itself. Back in, okay, we did that already. <laughs> um, back in, actually it was December 21, we wrote a blog, link down there in the bottom, um, that explored, I would say, how eBPF fits in with the service mesh and where it makes sense or might not make sense to run the proxies that we see in a service mesh. Because up to this point, we see the proxies deployed with the applications, like I said, almost atomically, they're part of the application. Um, and that gives us benefits, right? Because if we try to do things like identity and mutual TLS, we know the connection is going to end with the pod or with the application. That's where the sidecar runs. Or if the sidecar goes down or the app goes down, they, they're both considered to have gone down, right? If, that, if, if the sidecar goes down, the app is, gone, is basically down, right? Um, things like if I want to extend the capability of the proxy, I want to inject WebAssembly or something very custom to what an application needs, that's not going to affect you know, all the other applications. It's just the one, the one app that injected it there. So there, there are good things about the sidecar, and then there's some not so good things about the sidecar. And we started talking about that and, and where does eBPF fit and all that. Uh, we looked at the various models, shared, so sidecar is one extreme, let's say. Um, a shared node proxy is another extreme. Um, and we kind of saw, saw this in the early days of service mesh. Linkerd, the original Linkerd 1.x, was deployed like this. It was a big, you know, Scala based, JVM based proxy that didn't make sense to be deployed as a sidecar and was frequently deployed as a shared you know, uh, infrastructure, shared node proxy. And when you do this, you, know, you get the benefits of, of things that people who might run at scale might be more concerned about, things like resource overhead. You, you reduce the resource overhead in this, in this model. Um, you lose things like feature isolation, like security granularity. Um, and when you make changes to something like this, upgrading and so on, it, it can be pretty impactful on one hand, or it could be a lot easier because there's no sidecars. Um, and then we, so in this blog, like I said, we explored one end, uh, extreme, we explo explored the other side. And then we said, well, maybe there's something that we can achieve, some, something in between, something that balances out both extremes. It gets the benefits without too many of the drawbacks. Um, and in uh, September 2022, uh, we announced through the open source Istio project a, uh, uh, some work that we've been doing for probably about a year or so and then about four or five months into it we noticed Google was doing something similar and so we worked uh, with Google and we announced it together. Um, a, uh, a, a service mesh that we can run without the sidecars. We don't need the sidecars, but without taking as many of the drawbacks as the shared node proxy that we saw in the past. Yes. Uh, last time I checked, this was still in, in beta or alpha is it in the same stage? It's come a lot farther. Um, I would say we're shooting, we're shooting for production use cases here within the next quarter. Oh, cool. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Don't hold me to that though. <laughs> You're on record. Rough time. <laughs> Rough time. <laughs> um, okay, and so what, what we wanted to focus on was, number one, top priority is continuing to simplify operations. I mean, we built Glue Mesh for managing and simplifying running across 
clusters and exposing to multiple teams and you know the, the, the enterprise use cases. However, what if we're just looking at a single cluster? What about just the beginning experience? How do we get applications into the mesh? Well, you need to inject a sidecar. All right, well, that's not that bad, but it is bad for some uh, organizations that can't do that. We've run into use cases where um, an application had its own init container, and that init container communicated over the network and did a bunch of stuff before the application started up. It's an appropriate use for an init container in Kubernetes. Istio, when you in inject the sidecar, also uses an init container. And that init container does some IP tables magic so that all traffic routed to or from the application goes through the proxy. But in Kubernetes, there's no ordering of init containers. You can't specify the order of init containers. And you can run in into a scenario where the init container that the app needed uh, tries to run, and or actually it's the other way, and Istio went first and, and then the, theirs went and tried to run and the ordering was wrong. Like they couldn't communicate over the network because the proxy wasn't ready and all this stuff. Um, and so although sidecars, we try to keep them as transparent and you know, out of the way of the application as possible, we still run into those, those edge cases. Things like upgrading the service mesh. We have to upgrade the sidecar. We have to restart the application because the sidecar is there. Uh, so the benefits of having the sidecar be atomically part of the application are good for the application, but not so good for the platform owners. Because now that it's a little bit intrusive when you have to try to do um, upgrades or CVE patches and this kind of thing. You have to coordinate with the application developers. Things like Kubernetes jobs are not very well supported with uh, something like Service Mesh. You run a Kubernetes job, it's expected to complete. And if you put a sidecar there, the sidecar doesn't ever complete, the sidecar just keeps running. Now you have to build your own processes to figure out what Kubernetes jobs have ended, and, and it, it just there's, there's more operational overhead, and the service mesh is not as transparent as we like. Um, you know, cost reduction is uh, an important conversation for some people. I would say it's not the majority. Uh, none of our customers, very few of our customers have really complained that much about it, but it, it is a, a nice benefit if you're able to come up with an architecture that reduces the reliance on sidecars. And then another, another avenue that we've explored is, can we improve the performance? Envoy proxy can do a lot of things. Um, when we use Envoy, we have to, you know, especially if you enable it on an application that's already talking HTTP, Istio will auto or sniff and auto discover that it's HTTP and start processing it as if it was HTTP, which is good because you get telemetry about the number of requests that are going through failures and all that. But if you don't need that, maybe you just want mutual TLS and identity, all you really care about is that, then you don't need the layer seven properties of the proxy. Parsing layer seven takes up a lot of cycles. So if we can just, you know, kind of sidestep and just only use layer four parts of the proxy and not layer seven, then we can get better performance for those use cases. So that's what we focused on with, uh, with ambient mesh. What we did to implement this is we, first of all, we separated out layer seven from layer four in the mesh and how we adopt the capabilities of the mesh. What we said, what we thought is, hey, you know, trying to share a layer seven behemoth proxy with all the applications on a particular node, that's dangerous. Because you run into, you know, layer, um, noisy, noisy neighbor problems. Every app wants to configure their thing slightly differently. You run into, um, you know, potentially security vulnerabilities, uh, security, Vulnerabilities usually happen wherever the most complex code is, where there's a lot of code. Layer 7 is pretty complex stuff. Um, so what we said is we'll split the Layer 7 pieces out and make them optional, and people will opt in, but we want to separate it out and give people a chance to adopt the service mesh and just Layer 4 mutual TLS identity-based uh, uh, zero, zero trust properties of the mesh without opting into all the Layer 7 stuff if they don't want it. 
And like I said earlier, it's usually those use cases um, that people come to the mesh for, which is the uh, is mutual TLS and and the security properties. So for people can get started much easier without running a sidecar, uh, without taking on the overhead in terms of processing and, and so on of layer seven, uh, then it'll be easier to get applications into the mesh. And so we separate this out, it's called the secure transport layer, or there's a component called Z-Tunnel, Zero Trust Tunnel, that uh, we deploy as a shared um, proxy on the nodes, but it only does layer three and layer four. Um, and now, if you, and I didn't talk too much about our, uh, the networking parts because I was running out of time, but if you start to think about what we were doing with eBPF and controlling uh, the CNI a little bit more, what we're doing with this Z-Tunnel component actually starts to merge quite a bit with, uh, with the CNI. Now we're just adding the service mesh identity and mutual TLS capabilities down into the layer three, layer four networking. Yeah. If you mentioned uh, Cilium a few times and I saw it up on the slides. Are there any other CNIs uh, able to be managed by Glue Network? So Glue Network, which I didn't get, like I said, I didn't get a chance to, too much to dive into, uh, ran out of time. But Glue Network, what it does is it will manage the CNI through the CNI's own API. So just like we do with Istio, we can translate to Istio resources. Got it. We can translate to the CNI resources. Now, we can translate into... Calico, uh, OpenShift, you know, VPC, all, all these that have a specific API, we can translate into those. Right. Cilium's one of those. Um, we've also included um, kind of uh, actual break fix production support for Cilium as well. Oh, cool. But not for those other ones, but yeah. just for Cilium. Got it, makes sense. Yeah. So whether I'm running on AKS, EKS, on prem, if my CNI is Weave, Flannel, Calico, Cilium, can manage all of it. We can support okay. them. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, mostly mostly the support would would come from whoever you got your Kubernetes from. Sure, Cilium and EVPF were sort of a whole different ball game, and we we had been doing a bunch of work with EVPF previously for Layer Seven stuff and other stuff, and so we we sort of said we had a bunch of companies who said, "Hey, it's hard to find support for this stuff. Um, it's not really embedded in most Kubernetes distros." Like. Would you guys be willing to do this? And we had already done a bunch. So that's the reason it's sort of unique in that. But but in normal Kubernetes CNI, yeah, we we can deploy the same policies and do that consistently. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. The uh the next layer so in in ambient, Istio ambient, um the the Z tunnel or the secure transport layer handles layer four, and then the waypoint proxy layer handles layer seven. And we would deploy a separate waypoint proxy. This is where things like parsing, understanding the HTTP stream, so we can do retries, uh, so we can do jot header checks, um, you know, control traffic, split splitting traffic like we can with the sidecar. That's where a lot of that stuff is going to happen in the waypoint proxy layer. And we would deploy a waypoint proxy per application type. Right. So if we have application A, it's made up of ten instances. We'd probably deploy two waypoint proxies with high, high availability right? that represent application A. That waypoint proxy won't handle application traffic for B or C or any of the other ones. It's just for application A. So we still get some of the same isolation properties that we had in the sidecar, but now it's an externally running layer seven proxy. And Istio controls and manages the redirection of packets and connections, all this stuff, so that it flows through the secure transport layer. And then through the waypoint proxy layer, if you need layer seven capabilities, and then eventually down into the target uh, applications. Okay, so we have a Kubernetes cluster here. You can see we have a, a hello world service and a sleep service. Down on the bottom pane, you can see another view of the same cluster. Istio is not installed here. We don't have Istio. If I come back into my sample applications and exec into it, if I curl Hello World from the sleep application, I should see V1, we should load balance. This is normal, just Kubernetes sleep is calling Hello World. Now, I'm going to install Istio, and I'm going to set the profile, there's various profiles that you can set in Istio, to ambient. So 
I'm going to do Istio CTL install. And we'll give that a second. What that's going to do is install that Z-Tunnel component that I mentioned, which runs as a daemon set. So it runs a little agent on each of the nodes. I think there's two or three nodes in this cluster. We'll check it in a second. And it'll install the Istio control plane. And Istio then would be, let's see if we come back to the to here. We see Istio is installed now. If I click into Istio system, we see we have a, a CNI component, the Z tunnel, and Istio D. Istio D, if you're familiar with Istio, is the control plane. Now we have the option of running sidecars. You know, Istio sidecar support is uh, is not going away. But what we want to do is include the applications, the Sleep and the Hello World applications, into the service mesh without using sidecars. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to label the uh, default namespace with a uh, with with a label that. Istio will then use to key off of and, and, and then include those applications in the service mesh. So now that I've labeled that, back to our, our pane here, these services are now part of a service mesh. And if we take a look, okay, so this is the sleep application. When the sleep application talks to Hello World, in the diagrams that we saw before, it should be going through the Z tunnel process. Because the Z-Tunnel is where we um, add the mutual TLS uh, capabilities to the connection. So if we see that, sleep, sleep is deployed on the ambient worker node. So if I come back down here and find the Z-Tunnel that's running, looks like it's this one, on ambient worker, and we'll go into logs, go to full screen. If we come back to sleep, now when I get into sleep here and call hello world, we should start to see access logging that's showing that traffic is indeed flowing now through the Z tunnel. And it's mutually, you know, there's mutual TLS. If I brought up the, the traffic sniffer TCP dump, then we, we would be able to see that. Now, that's all good for layer four, layer three, layer four, and getting mutual TLS, which is, like I said, probably the, where people start first with the, with the service mesh. But layer seven, you know, we need the application part. We need the application networking part. Um, and so in Istio, the way that you specify layer seven policies is through the virtual service API. But before we do that, we want to deploy a waypoint proxy that represents the hello world service. Because like I said, waypoint is where we're going to implement layer seven capabilities. We deploy a waypoint proxy per service type. So if we apply this, we should see a waypoint proxy is being started right here. You see this here? That represents Hello World. So Istio will route traffic from the Z tunnel now to the waypoint proxy to implement layer seven behavior, if, if there are layer seven uh, policies, which there are not yet. So if we take a look at, the, at a virtual service that says match on slash hello, so this is layer seven. We have to understand that this is an HTTP call. And inject a fault 100% of the time, um, inject a five second delay. So if I apply this and then come back to my application, my sleep application, and make the call to hello world, we should, cross our fingers, see a delay here of about five seconds between uh, the sleep service and the hello world service. And so you can see we we're getting service mesh behavior, uh, layer seven even service mesh behavior. We'll exit out of this. And you can see we have no sidecars. And in fact, these applications have been running for, for a really long time. Um, and it's just as easy to undo any of this. We can just uh, uninstall Istio and give that a second. We should see that Istio is no longer there. Our applications don't know any of the difference. 
and we can still continue to call the, the hello world service like we did before. Uh, let's get rid of that label too. So that's Istio uh, Ambient Mesh, which came out in September. We announced it in September. Uh, we've been working pretty hard on it uh, to uh, mature it, to get as much of the capabilities of the sidecar available for Istio Ambient as well, and, um, and soon to be uh, ready to be able to run it in, in production. This is a, <clears throat> a deeply ignorant question, given that my, my knowledge of Kubernetes is paying by the second. Um, why doesn't ambient mesh exist within Kubernetes itself? That is a good question. I think for Kubernetes, I think they, they've said for a while that they want to they want to put a wall or a fence around the capabilities and the things that they want to, to worry about, right? And then they'll create custom resources or extension mechanisms for people to uh, build on top of and, and around. Um, and they want to give people choices. Um, and so I think the, that's, a, that's a position the Kubernetes community has said, well, we're not going to pick the CNI for you. We'll create a, an interface. We're not going to pick the container runtime for you. We're not going to pick the mesh for you. We're going to uh, give you interfaces and let the best of the best win out. Um, or at least that's my, my observation. I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess that does make sense because Kubernetes is supposed to be a container orchestrator, yeah. not a full stack of things. It, it's supposed to have one job. So I guess, yeah, the CNI is like the container storage interface. It provides right. a way of doing the thing with the kind of that, I guess the bare line, the base assumption is that when you start a container, it's not connected to anything. Right. Unless you say it should be and only these things, how you do that is through the container networking interface and then whatever comes from that. And the complexity comes just because when you start doing it a lot, because Kubernetes just, you end up with thousands and thousands of containers. So that's why this is all necessary. Yep. Yep. 